We do this every other Thursday at 7.30 on your interwebs. I am Jeff Skin Wade, part of the Ben and Skin Show, along with the other hip-looking guy in the glasses, Ben Rogers, also of that Ben and Skin Show. And the other two gentlemen that are with us are whiskey geniuses. We have the head distiller at Balcona's Distilling. That would be Jared Hempstead. And then the other man is Alex Elrod. He's a man of many hats, and he has cool hats, as he does a little bit of marketing, a little bit of, uh, let's just say, brand advocating. And he is a fun guy to imbibe with, and he knows a lot about Balcones. This is the portion of the program where we are basically doing the internet version of when a hacky sack circle first gets going outside of a jam band concert. There's just a couple guys there and they're kicking it around and they're waiting for the circle to expand. And that's what we are doing is we're waiting for everyone to join us for Whiskey Talk Session 3, in which today we are going to be focusing on three expressions that you all should try and have. Number one being the Mirador of the Texas Single Malt. This is really damn good. Number two being the elusive and wildly popular right out the gate, Balcones, Texas Buck, which will get the backstory from Jared on all of that. And then finally, the dessert portion of our uh, presentation tonight will be the Texas single malt finished in the rum cask. It's the rum cask finished Texas single malt. So I think as we populate our internet fun, why don't we now let everyone have a chance to step up to the mic and say hello and we'll start with you, Jared. How are you doing this very fine evening? We're doing good, man. Yeah, it's been a nice couple of days in Waco. The evenings have been cool. I've been doing a little stroller walks through the neighborhood with the kids and uh, the dog. And, you know, the, it's a nice, nice time to be on the back porch after the sun goes down. Just doing a lot of blending, working on some new products for uh, the next coming months. And, uh, yeah, liking the whiskey. I feel like everyone who enjoys whiskey also enjoys dogs. What kind of dog do you have there? So we, me and my wife have always had like uh, rescue pound terrier mutts. Okay. So they're always pretty small and like scraggly, wiry hair, little things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, our last one just died about a year and a half ago. And we had had that dog for 18 years. Wow. Yeah, that was a big deal. And uh, so we just literally just got a new dog like a week and a half or two weeks ago. My daughter, my nine-year-old has been wanting a dog. Ooh. And uh, we were hoping to get the 20-month-old potty trained. So we weren't potty training a human and a dog at the same time. <laughs> but uh, I think during, during lockdown, during quarantine, man, it became impossible. We couldn't even find like Craigslist dogs, shelter dogs were going like within 24 hours. Yeah. It was nuts. I guess everybody was getting a dog. So, uh, yeah, it took us a while to even find one. And we found this. I mean, it's like six pounds, this little scraggly terrier mutt. And it's it's almost perfect. It's about four months that's, old. That's a lot of it's a lot of pressure on a new dog coming in behind an 18 year veteran who served right. the family well, superstar, yeah. Hall of Fame, Ring of Honor. How do yeah. you deal with the mental side just to let the dog know, just be your own dog? Yeah. <laughs> uh Luckily, it's been long enough. We went for a while. I think we had the, we had our other dog so long when she died. We did, we kind of wanted a break, I think. And it's it's yeah. been a while. And uh, yeah, it feels good. And this one's a good fit personality. Like she just went straight in, and uh, we wanted her to be you know our daughter's dog, and she's sleeping with her. And of course, we're like, you've got to take her out. You've got to feed her. Otherwise, <laughs> she's gonna think she's gonna think she's somebody else's dog if you're not taking care of business. I find uh, it fascinating that as uh, as Ben was asking that question, he had Dirk in the background and Luca was looking over his shoulder waiting to see what your answer would be, Jared. Pretty amazing. <laughs> now, before we hear from Ben, we need to hear from Elrod. He is a man that's uh, in normal non-pandemic times. He's a man that's about town, uh, being with the people, getting the pulse of uh, the whiskey world and the imbibing, uh, drinking, bartending type world that we all love to exist in. How are you doing, Mr. Elrod? Well, skin. Uh, I am. I am. I'm doing great. Uh, I'm enjoying uh, the beautiful sunshine. Uh, ecstatic to be here. Truly, this is one of the best portions of the day, of the week, of the month. Um, this is not plugged in. Uh, no, I'm doing good. I'm doing wait, good. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. Uh, oh, excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, here, here on set. Uh, I am. Um, 
<laughs> uh, doing good. This is uh, I no, genuinely I'm excited for these these kind of things. So uh, I like to talk whiskey. I like to talk nonsense. Uh, let's let's I don't know. I'm excited for this, guys. So, I, but I'm doing good. Family's doing good. Wife's due in about a month. So, All right. bring so, it on. Yeah. So back to you. Well, you know, uh, Ben and I were talking earlier about uh, just how much we've been looking forward to getting session three going since the last one. So, Ben, I know you're very jacked up for this this evening. Yeah, I'm fired up, man. I'm looking forward to it. I've got all three of the bottles we're going to be discussing uh, tonight, and I can't wait to hear, you know, Jared's thoughts on how they come together, how they came together, and Alex's thoughts on, uh, you know, just just about him. And I love. I could listen to Alex talk about anything, and I'd be interested in just hit, listening to him talk about that microphone that doesn't work. But um, I think what Jared said hit on something. You know, he's talking about getting outside with the family, with the dog, with the kiddo. I think it's so important right now, man. Just the mental health as aspect. Just get the heck out of your house. And it, it's so bizarre, too, because you go outside and it's the weather's beautiful. And you're like, wait, there's nothing wrong with this world. This world we're in is fine. And uh, it's just but I do think it's healthy to get out and about and, and move around. So I think that's a good place to jump off. Yeah, yeah go we're, ahead, we're really lucky. I mean, we're not. I don't know what kind of neighborhoods you guys live in, but Waco's not a massive place it's a pretty spread out and the part of town we live in you know we've got some acreage behind the house with woods and a creek and i it's been crucial you know to the to just yeah staying sane and it's it's one part of it that you know i think if everyone's being honest with themselves some things have changed that you're like man i, I hope it doesn't go back completely to normal because that part's been really there's just the pace of life has been a little bit slower you know i haven't had to travel uh get up, you go to work, you get home and you cook out and we sit in the backyard with the kids and they swing and, you know, pick berries and whatever. And it's, uh, yeah, I hope that part doesn't change. Especially if the uh, quality of our air can stay the way that it has changed is there's been right. so much less driving and congestion and all that. You live in uh, sunny Oak cliff. Is that right? All right. I do. It's uh, it is quite sunny. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm walking distance to Kessler. So, there's, I mean, just looking kind of out, out my window here in the living room, we've seen since we got on, you know, 10 or 15 people walking by. So um, it, it's nice to also live somewhere that is in these older homes, you know, Winneka Heights has a big broad streets um, and there's a lot of folks walking around. Uh, I think it's really kind of put people a little more in touch with each other, right? Because there is that kind of uh, camaraderie of you, me, and we're all in this together. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes people that would normally just leave their headphones in, um, which is not a bad thing, but, you know, oh, oh, hey, hey, good morning, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it's, it has been fun for us on, on the weekends, to go late, you know, and in the evening before it gets too dark, go go walk and uh, just experience outside uh, with a little bit of a different perspective. So, um, yeah, I, I think we're, we're pretty spoiled, I think, in Texas in general, because we don't, um, you know, like some of our friends that live in Manhattan, you know, that are uh, millions of people. Um, mm -hmm. so, it's fun to be able to see the sky and, and the foliage. Um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Well, I think that, uh, you know, what our plan is that when you guys join us every, uh, every other Thursday here, we'll talk and sample some whiskey. Hopefully you were able to see the social media stuff so that you have these three bottles in your possession as you're going to sample and experience these with us tonight. And then after that, why don't you go for a nice little whiskey walk around your neighborhood to cap all this off. And, uh, let, and with, that's probably a good reminder, by the way, you should be following uh, Balcones on all the social media platforms so you can stay up to date on uh, not only the new expressions that are coming out, a lot of times where you can find it, of course, what we're doing with Whiskey yeah. Talk. But gentlemen, why don't we start with the Texas Single Malt Mirador a bit, uh, version expression of this. And let's start, Jared, by uh, why is it called Mirador? So the... Uh... Balcones is named for, you know, the fault line, the escarpment that runs almost directly right under I-35, almost all the way up, up to Oklahoma and almost all the way down to Mexico. It's the most dormant fault uh, in North America. It's been dormant for about 50 million years, they say. Wow. Um, but if, if it ever decides to move, I-35 is toast because um, it's, it's right on it. But that explains any, any Central Texans probably noticed how drastic, especially around the Hill Country area, the terrain, vegetation, everything is east and west of 35, especially like in the San Antonio, between San Antonio and Austin, it becomes really apparent. You know, you've got 
grassland stuff. And then all of a sudden it's the hill country and it's limestone and it's cliffy and it's cedar everywhere. And um, it's because those are two separate plates. So soil makeup's different, all that stuff. Um, here in Waco, especially right down by the river, uh, balcones is, you know, the Spanish word for balcony, but it created so many bi-level, like if you ever go down to the river downtown, uh, one side of the river is, you know, 80, 100 foot limestone cliff and then the river and then the other side's flat. So that that reminded them of balconies, you know, look like someone stand, you know, if you're on one side, it's like you're in a balcony uh, looking over. Cool. Um, anyway, uh, when we early, early in brand development, like like you do, we we kind of explored words and related words and related concepts. And while they're not exactly synonymous, um, there is some overlap in the meaning of balcony and mirador. A mirador is a, you know, a place, a lookout, a place you look from. Um, and so sometimes it could be used to describe those little parapets on top of roofs where there's like a little dugout, you know, mm -hmm. there's a wall, but there's a little spot for someone to look out or on the yeah. side of old castles, there'd be like a little pod, like a little window thing that kind of juts out and someone could look from there and kind of survey the landscape. And um, so we kind of always, we had had that name as, a, as an option for an alternative expression kind of in the back pocket for a while. Um, before we why, used it on this. Why don't we do the uh, smell, the sniff, and the taste, and then let's talk about it getting out there and people's reaction to it. We'll do that with you, Elrod. But let's begin, gentlemen. What are you smelling here? And that was a that was a fresh crack, wasn't it? Yes, it was, sir. Out of baby. Cheers I didn't want to over pour. Is this about the right amount you want to pour? Or is that a little strong too? I think it's supposed to be like up here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so there is a, uh, you know, I guess I'm sort of comparing it to some of the other Texas single malts from you guys, mm -hmm. but there is a sweetness to this that I do not smell, but that I do taste. Hmm. Are you guys experiencing that at all? Like, I don't smell the little sweet taste that I get when I sip on it. This, this, I mean, to me, this, this is a little more perfumey. Uh, I, I feel like this is a, it's, it's not, it's not quite as mysterious. I think it's got a really complex nose, but I feel like there's a level of a dark characters to a lot of our single malts um, that kind of has like a, a mysterious quality, uh, almost like a deeper musk that's uh, really nice. Whereas this is much more of a light perfumey, um, kind of a, a spring quality floral, um, really grain forward, uh, which I think is, is fantastic. Um, especially if you're familiar with our other single malts. Mm -hmm. um, this one, I, I do feel like this is probably one of the best smelling whiskeys that we, we make, we have ever made. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is one of my favorites. I mean, yeah right right off right off right off the bat guys uh this is actually my favorite whiskey we have ever made so oh wow wait now we know. what wait 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 what? seriously yeah for sure i think i, think I remember you saying wow. that couple i think in episode yeah. one you said that i believe yeah but yeah i, just, I think it's a, it's a little bit a little more floral uh the grain is much more present i think right up right up there was really like delicate a little bit of a toasted quality it is interesting it's uh in terms of the sniff and just the 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 smell, uh, it, it quite possibly I mean it 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 quite possibly could be the best smelling uh, whiskey I've ever smelled. It's just it's beautiful. I mean it's truly beautiful just to sniff it. You know, um, you know like sometimes you get a uh, you get someone oh you know the waiter brings out your food at a real nice restaurant and it's just made by a master chef or something and you're like don't even want to eat it because you don't want to make it you don't want to mess it up <laughs> uh, the plate so gorgeous i mean this smells just beautiful man so much presentation you can't eat yeah let's make a candle out of this jared can you can we make a candle <laughs> i've never made a candle before but i'm sure this is, i would do i would buy a lot of candles that smelled like this i have a hard time believing jared couldn't be a great candle maker just I'm sure you can figure it out. I've just never yeah, done agreed. it. You know? Yeah, agreed. Jared, My, what's, uh, what, what I'm, give yeah, the, I'm not. Uh, that's that's a that's level two prepper, and I'm 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 a, you know I'm not quite. 
Just the wall of can can canned goods. No, yeah, no, I don't do that. I, I can, uh, you know, I can I can make rope from plant leaves, and I can start a fire with a bow, bow drill. But I <laughs> is I, I okay. So we we talk about a lot of the different expressions from balcones, and um, it's really cool when you when you go to wherever you buy fine wines and spirits, and you see all the different variations and all the different expressions and it kind of like when you collect cool things it makes you want to have all of them makes you want to collect all of them some of them are so rare that you really feel fortunate when you stumble across them you know and you need to jump on them when they when they arise how would you say mirador ranks in that window like is it hard to get your hands on is it available everywhere is it new is it old like where does it sit with like for the consumer who's like all right you guys sold me it smells great tastes great is it easy to find um, I'll, I'll jump at uh, Jared's yeah. perspective on the production side is, 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 uh, is I think a, an interesting perspective, but as far as sales, we, we just, of course, started uh, releasing it to the, to the wild, if you will, over the last couple of weeks. Um, so you can find it, uh, relatively easy right now, uh, across Texas. Um, it, it will be, um, I, what I've seen at least the last week it, it is, um, it's not in the locked box, uh, which we, we prefer that these are all billboard is what we call a billboard effect, which is like this where they're all next to each other. So you can find it next to the rest of our whiskeys. It will be a little bit of a, a premium uh, price point. Uh, so, you know, a little bit higher than uh, 65, uh, no, actually higher. I'm sorry, higher than that. Um, 70, 75 plus. Um, but it's uh, it just released for the first time in two years. So right now it is kind of a, a resurgence in um, visibility. Yeah. So yeah, our, um, there's a couple of things that went into, uh, developing and, and putting this, this expression together, um, over the years, as we transitioned, you know, we used to use the small barrels, we've changed our stills, we've moved to a different facility. Um, a lot of production things changed the new, the new warehouse that we had built has kind of a little bit slower wood extraction, which was nice. It was a little bit softer, but back in the day, we used to mix um, maybe about a third to a quarter of a single malt blend and the regular one single malt would be used barrels or refill barrels. Um, and the rest would be virgin oak. So for anybody watching who's not like uh, super into whiskey regulations and traditions, uh, single malt made in Scotland, uh, Irish malt whiskeys, they're all done in refill barrels. So they're barrels that have already had something else, the large majority of which is bourbon. So American whiskey, on the other hand, rye uh, and bourbon, the, by far the most you know, well-known and most the largest volume of American whiskey is those two categories. Uh, they are legally required to be in virgin oak. So you get a lot more color. Um, the oak influence, you know, the oak influence on a new versus used barrel is uh, going to be in the color, assuming they haven't colored, artificially colored the whiskey. Mm -hmm. So we, we used to always have these barrels that we used in that blend. Um, and every once in a while, it was it started kind of feeling a little bit like a bummer that they were getting kind of covered up by much bolder, woodier, spicier barrels in those blends, and they were kind of getting lost. Um, and one of my favorite uh, regions of Scotland and styles of Scotch is uh, Speyside, which is known for being understated. It's fruity. It's kind of delicate. Um, the grain is somewhat forward. It can be kind of like grassy or like dried hay notes, um, floral, um, in some ways very different than what we are known for and most of what we put out. Um, so it was kind of twofold. Uh, we love that area. I don't think anybody would assume we'd make something like this if they're familiar with most of our line. And there was also a little bit of, um, a little bit of, uh, you know, you want to twist the knife and say, I told you so when, when you, when, when you think people maybe have you pegged as what you're capable of or what you want to make, and you've got a little more going on behind the scenes than that. And it was, it definitely was a little bit of that. Like, Oh yeah. Oh, you got us, somebody, Oh, some people got us figured out. Okay. Well, actually we make a whole bunch of stuff. It's very different that doesn't usually see the light of day. Um, and so we, we wanted to, wanted to get that out there and share it because we were just, you know, we're taking it home and drinking it ourselves and make, mixing up little tiny blends for fun and then using those barrels in the regular blend and they were just disappearing. And we decided 
that um, ah. we wanted to wanted to share that. Um, yeah, it because we worked on this for about the first release of this was super tiny in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, distil uh, it did leave the distillery, but there wasn't that much of it. Um, this year's was much bigger, and we've been dead laying down a lot of uh, single malt into non-virgin barrels, used barrels for the last two years, with the intention of this becoming kind of uh, the uh, you know the older brother that maybe we never make that much of it, but hopefully we can make enough to where it's 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 mostly available most of the year. Hopefully, starting next year or the year after that, um, for for people once again that the the big robust American wood style is not really their jam um, and to show how much wood influence if you were to go grab this and go grab the regular single malt it's a great side by to do at home and 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 realize that this is starting with the same liquid and the the wood influence is so massive that they they they're you know almost indi on, almost indistinguishable as being you know the same base spirit okay this That's, is awesome. you know you know what i'm thinking of skin right yeah but before you get to that bit i want to say something right quick is that the uh jared is that the difference and what just people would very, I don't want to say generically, but say smoothness, the difference in that uh, expression, which talking about from the regular Texas single malt to the Mirador, someone would say, well, this, the Mirador is more smooth if they were just drinking it neat or on the rocks or something. Probably. Like that. Yeah. It's um, I, there's a few words that are thrown around in whiskey world that aren't, it's not that they're not helpful. It's that they mean a bunch of different things to different people. Um, and so smooth is one that I usually would encourage people to try and flesh out right. what that means. Like when my nine-year-old says she's not feeling good and I say, okay, I need to know a little bit more about that. If you need me, if I'm going to help, is it your tummy? Is it, did you get scratched? Did you kick you know, your shin on the bed? I don't feel good. Doesn't, I can't do anything really with that. And, and finishes on whiskey is usually people are, when people are talking about smooth, it's, they're almost always talking about how it wraps up. Yes. Um, but there's lower proof stuff that can finish really aggressively. So it's not, it's not just ABV. It's not just heat. Um, but sometimes something that could be soft is just cast strength. And just by that nature, it ends up feeling kind of rough and aggressive. So there's, there's a bunch of different things that could mean, and especially as a maker, if one of my blenders was to tell me smooth, I would do like I would do with my kid. And I'd be like, okay, are we talking about alcohol aggressiveness? Is there a heat to it? Is it wood? Is it spice? Mm -hmm. Is it, Sometimes you can almost get a prickle, like almost effervescent uh, carbonation feeling sometimes from whiskey. Like there's a, there's a lot of things that go on. And of course, while we're trying to blend a product, that feedback's much more helpful if it's more specific. But just in general, talking about whiskey, the more specific you can be with your language, um, it just increases your appreciation anyway. And that's not a jab at anyone. It's um, encouragement to explore what, you know, say, you know, the easiest thing to do in someone's vocabulary for talking about whiskey is not that great. You can, you can, um, model some things just like we do same thing with like I do with the kids, you know, like, I wish you could have handled that differently. I wish next time maybe do something like this or say something like this. Um, so model it, model good behavior, uh, by using specific language. And even with yourself, when you go, man, this is floral, have the little angel sitting on your shoulder, tell you, say more about that. Are we talking perfume, hand soap, a specific kind of flower? Is it fresh? Is it honeysuckle? Is it roses, rose water? Is it your grandma? Like you're, you're having a connection that's real to something. Let's, let's kind of dig and let's figure out what that actual thing is. And, and, and now you're, you're bonding with that, whole, that experience and that moment and that whiskey that's in front of you in a way that's beyond, it's floral and smooth. But I do think this is an easy drinking whiskey. Yeah. Um, yeah. Partly because the wood's so soft. I think notes that are fruity and floral as opposed to spicy, woody, they're just softer notes, you know? This is actually higher ABV than the regular single malt, you know, by a few percent. And I don't think it it drinks that way. I don't think you would know that without looking at the label, you know? Yeah, and I saw you get very excited. Yeah, it makes me think of a couple different things. The... Uh... First of all, when you talk about uh, not just saying it's floral, but kind of talking about what it, what that is, athletes are like that. When you first start interviewing athletes, when they're rookies, you ask them a question, they have a yes or no answer. Uh, when they're veterans, they paint a bigger picture because they you know they they learn how to articulate their their thoughts better. Uh, that's what yeah. that made me think of. And the terms of uh, uh, 
talking about not trying to have them peg you and know exactly what you're going to do and predict your every move. It reminds me of the movie, the hunt for red October. And it was the idea that, uh, you know, the submarine commander, uh, you know, being in a submarine at the bottom of the ocean is really all about uh, trying to anticipate what a submarine captain's going to do. And so this one submarine captain, Ivan, if he thought you knew his every move every once in a while, he would do something to totally throw you off. So you could, he was unpredictable. And, it, and he would turn his submarine in the opposite way of what you were expecting. And it's called a crazy Ivan. And so <laughs> right when your uh, submarine's following another submarine, if he busted a crazy Ivan on you, he would catch you trying to follow him too closely. So in pop culture terms, we call what you're talking about. Right when you try to think uh, you know exactly what we're doing, we bust out a crazy Ivan on your ass. Nice. That's cool. How have, you, uh, how have you enjoyed being out and about amongst the people, Elrod, and exploring how the crazy Ivan has uh, made its way around uh, whiskey drinkers in Texas? Uh, I, it's, it's interesting. Um, we, we are, I think we're pretty fortunate, um, Balconies, because we, we released, again, and it wasn't necessarily by, I mean, it was by design that we knew these whiskeys would make, make their way to the, sh you know, the, the market that around this time, obviously we didn't know that, you know, COVID was going to hit obviously, but um, it, it's really cool to still see a lot of fans. Um, obviously we don't know a lot of their personal stories, personal lives, but they're, they're still willing to, you know, reach out to us, try to track these bottles down uh, or share their excitement, you know, like we've seen on the Facebook page of, um, Hey, I saw y'all talking about this and I went ahead and grabbed it. And which to us, you know, we, we, we know that Mirador is extremely, you know, expensive for, for, especially for the average consumer. So, right. Um, I think it's it's fun for us to be able to talk about these because we love these whiskeys so much and to see people jumping at the opportunity to grab these during a time like right now where I know everybody's trying to save money in, in whatever way that they can. Uh, so to to kind of come full circle around something that we, we think is filled with a lot of camaraderie and that is enjoying um, really great whiskey. It's, it's cool to see people still willing to go out. Um, and we're fortunate right now that uh, folks have still been supporting Balconies by purchasing bottles uh at, at the distillery and out in in the wild so i, I, I want to say something quickly before we are you guys cool moving on to the texas box by the way sure I, i'd like to say something about uh what you just mentioned on the price point one of the things that i don't know if it's psychological or what but when you are drinking a spirit that is in a, just a higher quality spirit and obviously, if you're paying more, you expect to have a higher quality spirit. We would like to believe, and I think we all know this, that all the Balcones whiskeys are upper level. It's all really, really good stuff. But when you're trying to make that decision, if you're going to spend an extra 10 to 15 to $20 or whatever that is, me personally, I've always found the conversation is more intriguing. The music sounds better. The weather is a little nicer. Uh, when you do spend that extra bit of coin to get the better quality product. Um, and so when you are drinking something like the Mirador that you've spent a little bit more on, for me, maybe it's psychological, but I just feel like the experience is always a little bit better. At least that's how it tends to work out for me. So hopefully it works out the same for you folks as well. Man, the Texas Bach, boy, did that cause a stir when it hit the streets lord have mercy you guys created a monster with this one <laughs> yeah yeah it's a bummer there's not really that much of it um we're, we're trying to figure out if 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 we might lay some more down uh you know it took a little bit over two years to get that done so if we lay some more down now uh we might have a, a little bit more coming up in two years after this we do have some left and we've got some ideas of what to do with the rest of the barrels um for some releases next year to maybe tide us over until we can get some more laid down and matured for the year after that. But yeah, it was a, I was, I was telling the story to someone earlier and now that I'm trying to actually remember it correctly, I don't remember if they called or if they emailed, I, I feel like I was blending and I got a call and I thought someone was messing with me. I thought it was a joke. Cause what they said was that the, the master brewer at Shiner was on the line and I was like, that's okay, whatever. Um, but it really was Tom, you know, it's become a friend and, and uh, we were excited because a lot of the role that whiskey brands usually play in beer world is just, Hey, we, we put this beer in a Jack Daniels barrel. Right. 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 Um, 
And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of great stuff going on, but that's not really a collaboration. That's just kind of like, you were gonna do a whiskey barrel aged beer. And it's cool if you decided to do that with a local company instead of a, a, a brand from Kentucky or something. Um, but that's not really a collaboration. And being beer guys ourselves for a long time, we thought, man, when we ever get the chances to do some cool stuff with breweries, we really would like to get a little more creative than just that. Um, so we, while we haven't helped design any of the beers that they've barrel aged in our barrels, we've had a lot of interaction, a lot of discussion. Um, their normal, you know, product development, creative team approach. I'm sure it's been a pain to have to kind of kick stuff to us and see what we think and toss ideas around. Um, but they've been really inclusive with us on the beers, the kind of beers they're, they're making and to, to barrel age and release it out of our barrels. And they seemed to think it was no big deal at all that they were excited about getting barrels. And I said, well, do you think we could make a whiskey out of, I mean, I knew right off the bat, we wanted to make a whiskey out of Schinerbach and that's yeah. proprietary information. They got a secret, you know, they got a proprietary recipe. They have their own lager strain. That's not, you know, something I can buy from a, from a sales person. And uh, they seemed to think like we were crazy, like, uh, sure, if you want, whatever. And um, so, we, yeah, so we did. And they came down for it. We mashed in. And just to clarify to anybody who knows beer and whiskey processes, beer is always going to get boiled after, after the mashing process. And then, of course, hops get added during the boil. Whiskey is not treated that way. So obviously, we skipped those steps. Anything other than grain and yeast and water going into a whiskey would make it not a whiskey. So hops would make it a flavored uh, whiskey. Um, and I don't, I'm not a big fan of hops distilled anyway. That's a whole other story. Um, so yeah, we got their recipe. We ordered the ingredients from their suppliers at the proportions they, they'd said. They drove down here with uh, a whole team of people and a camera crew to, to, to kind of document the day and a bunch of uh, stainless drums full of their, their liquid yeast. And uh, we laid it down and as soon as it was coming off the stills, we knew something was something was different. Um, it, it definitely has enough of our character to not be a stranger to someone who's a Balcones fan. Mm -hmm. um, but we've never used lager yeast before. We've always wanted to in a distilled spirit. And there's actually some pretty, pretty good like industry circular documentation about how interesting that is and how different the result is. Um, and now that this is ready, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out the, the most efficient and cost effective way to do some more lager experiments with some of our other products because we're really happy with how it turned out. Yeah, it's fantastic. It, I, I like what you said, how it's not a stranger to those who are familiar with the Balcones family. There's no question about that. But it also doesn't feel like it'd be a stranger to somebody that's a big Shinerbach fan, which is awesome. Uh, yeah. And then just the nose on it, I, I feel like I distinct, uh, I, I'm, I'm catching a distinct butterscotch of some sort. Is there some sort of butterscotch in there? And I'm wondering what, what Jared, with your palate and in your nose, what you smell when you smell it. Um, there's some things that I smell sometimes and I hesitate to say outside of certain circles. Um, but there is, uh, there's an, there's an acidity, there's a sourness on the nose that, um, is different. We don't do sour mashing. So sour mash, you know, Kentucky bourbons, uh, there's a, there's this whole backset process where some of the, some of the ingredients, some of the washes left to develop some acetic bacteria. So some vinegar, which beer will do if left out, they do that on purpose and that gets added back in. So you get some acetic quality and we don't usually do that, but I do get a little bit of that in here. That reminds me more of like weeded bourbons from Kentucky, um, which I love. It's super, I mean, it is a funny thing to think, I mean, you can't really smell salt. There's certain things you just can't, they don't really actually smell, mm -hmm. but it smells sweet, although sugar is not volatile. It's not evaporating and coming into our noses, but it just, it smells round. I get a lot of baking spices and cinnamon, nutmeg. I mean, you can just by smelling it, you can tell it's going to have a big body. Um, it's going to be really nice round texture. It's going to be sweet. Man, man, when I when I drink it, I, I think the you know you go to memories. To me, I have the same finish on this that I would have after having a big bite of pancakes with maple syrup. Mm -hmm. It's got that finish to it. 
Um, and I tend to go, well, that's kind of a sweet thing or, you know, but that's, that's where it takes me to in my memory banks. Yeah. It's extraordinary. Yeah. This is, you can almost, this thanks, is a big thank deal. You. Thank you. Um, it's funny what your brain can start associating once something like that comes in. Cause you mentioned that, um, my wife does a lot of sourdough, even, even pre quarantine sourdough is always kind of around and those starters have a very specific smell. That's a little bit sour and kind of funky. Um, but I can almost, I can almost get batter now. You're talking about pancakes. I can yeah. almost smell batter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I was, was going to yeah. go the direction of kind of whenever you're, <clears throat> before you're baking the dough, it's in the bowl rising, peel off whatever yeah. cover you have in order to check on the, um, the dough rising. And you kind of get a whiff of that a little more of it, that, that kind of like dough. It's a little bit, it almost has like an, a slightly, a, it, what, yeah, it seems like almost acidic like citrus mm -hmm. just light i don't know it's really cool you know i wonder about this like if it's like a band i mean jared you you're in there making this whiskey and all different types of expressions and i wonder if it's like a band in the studio you record an album and you think you you know hey the 20 great songs 10 great songs whatever it is and to you they're all your babies and you're just like hey these right. are all okay maybe a couple of these are better than the others i i don't know it's really all preference is it ever surprise you? I mean, because they're all great, but does it ever surprise you the way the public might react to one and not to another? Because this one, I mean, people were blowing up our Facebook page, calling into our show, feverishly trying to get out and go buy it. And we've seen that with a few other types of Balcones, but did that surprise you at all that it was like took off the way it did? Not really. I mean, I... I think some of the other people in the company that aren't born and raised in Texas were a little bit like, wow, that was crazy. Did you guys see that coming? We were like, yeah, we, yeah, we made a whiskey with Shiner Bach. And not only that, they gave us, they gave us the thumbs up to use like their trademark copyrighted graphics. Like they literally just sent me the art files. That is, that's the same art file they used to print on the thing. I couldn't believe they let us do that. And I told them from the beginning, that's what I wanted. They threw a couple of ideas around and I just kept pushing. I was like, no, I really just want to use your color scheme, the Ram, the whole deal. And uh, eventually they were like, okay, fine, fine. One of the coolest things about this is like, other than the uh, non-disclosure agreement that we signed because they were going to tell us what the recipe is, which is obviously mm -hmm. a secret worth protecting. Right. Nothing else has happened. Like yeah. this has been a buddy deal. I, I hope they don't come after me because I have their graphics that I don't have any, I don't have any document pro proving I'm, I have the right to use that. Um, you know what this is, man? Here's what this is. This is a game recognized game moment because um, th this is very significant aside from how good it is. Uh, and it's significant for the reasons that you laid out. Ben and I always like to talk on the show about uh, stereotypes of Texas versus the reality of Texas. And there's a lot of things that are, Texan that someone from Massachusetts wouldn't understand as Texan and Shinerbach for most of us. I don't know about you guys. I know it was for me is the first beer I ever had that wasn't either malt liquor, Coors, Miller, or Bud. It was the first, if you want to say craft beer or however you want to determine that, that was the first one I ever drank because of where I live. Right. And it was the first one I was like, Hey, you want to drink some good beer? Let's drink some Shinerbach. And so there is a very, for, you know, I, I think all of us grew up here. There is a very Texan experience about drinking Shiner and enjoying Shiner for the first time. And the fact that uh, they did let you guys do this without a team of lawyers, like effing it all up. That's a game recognized game moment. They're not going to let any spare dudes do that. So you, that I would imagine that's a pride point for you guys. Yeah. I mean, and like I said, they, they called, I mean, it wasn't, yeah, the whole process was pretty cool. It was um, it was organic. exactly that. I mean, it felt very validating. And um, say what you want. The, the the beer games changed a lot, and you know, since uh, I got really into beer in like the late '90s, um, and there's been multiple waves and cre peaks and crests of and troughs for for craft beer. Um, but I feel like we're really lucky in Texas because some of the old guard. There's other parts of the country where the old guard is kind of like a dinosaur mm -hmm. and our old guard in Texas is still super solid shiner, yeah. especially when it comes to loggers, like they know what they're doing and they do it really well. 
I don't know why I actually told them unsolicited advice to those marketing folks. I told them to spend a couple million dollars instead of trying to push some new expression or play around with some new style. It's like when it comes to just crushable loggers, when it's summer and it's 104 outside or you're mowing the lawn or you're going down to the lake, they need to, have you ever had the premium, the little gold can with the red, like super throwback, super throwback looking label. Um, Like, man, you guys need to take PBR and Lone Star to town, spend some money to push this thing and become like the summer hot weather crusher that every Texan needs to be drinking. Drop the price just like a buck per six pack and just go murder everybody. Mm -hmm. It is so good for that kind of beer. If if that's what you're in the mood for, you know, the the freezers, you know, you've got it it literally like 32 or 31.5 crisp. It's a crusher. Um, Anyway, they loggers, they do so well, but the same thing with like kind of our heritage, even like second wave, we've got real ale, St. Arnold's uh, live Oak, all these, they're, they're still, completely relevant brands who do really, really, really good work. So I feel like we're fortunate in Texas. We can kind of tip our hat to some of the, some of our predecessors in, in, on the beer side of of things and uh, without any shame because they just really, they all do good work. Um, Well, you you know, Jared, one of the things people will tell you is they'll say, Hey man, never toot your own horn. Let someone else toot it for you. I don't listen to those people. I'm going to toot my own horn. Me and Ben have a brewery called Roller Town that's up and coming. And that Roller Town light is going to be in that market. And we're proud of it. But uh, we do get comments as this whiskey talk goes on. And some people are, are texting in right now asking about a potential Balcones Roller Town collab. And just know that the two guys wearing glasses as part of this four man panel are way into that idea. We think that's an you know, awesome idea. You know, our, our head brewer, Tommy Miller, is a huge Balcones fan, too. And uh, he was texting us pictures he's watching and he's drinking each bottle along with us, taking a break from brewing beer. So uh, obviously, we love you guys. Hey, so yeah. uh, I want to ask you, Mr. El- Mr. Elrod, is, the, uh, is your uh, expectation of what the Texas Bach was going to be did I'm assuming it met that expectation, but what did you think it was going to be when you guys started all this versus what you're actually sipping on with us right now? Um, I, I remember one day, I don't, I, I was helping with a tour in the distillery and normally you can see a lot of our grain that, that are in super sacks, which are really big, basically just big grocery bags that sit on wooden pallets and walked by and there was stuff, there were grain sacks that were completely covered. And I was like, that's odd. Um, and I don't remember who it was at the time. It might've been actually, it might've been a tour of Tommy, our distillery manager, who's also a big beer guy. And he was like, that's the Shiner grain. And it was kind of like a, Oh, Whoa, like this is happening. And then, you know, you fast forward a little bit and I I remember them talking, like kind of geeking out, uh, about like, Whoa, like the, the cuts from the, you know, like what was coming off the stills was like something different is going on here. And then I remember, um, like six months ago, they pulled some samples or something and Jared, um, and Gabe, uh, were, were both kind of just like, like, oh my gosh, like some, something's going on here as well. Um, whenever they had all the, the samples out, uh, from the barrels that they were looking to blend. And it was just kind of like this every once in a while, we would like, oh yeah, we've got Shiner laid down. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then, um, to see it finally release, uh, I mean, I knew it was going to be a big deal especially when I saw the label and I knew we were going to, you know, adopt the the red wax, like we've got on single malt, but kind of all the, the nod and, and homage to, to Shiner Bach with the label. Um, I knew it was going to be big. I didn't, I don't think that I expected that the first day uh, of sales in the market that we would sell well over half of what was available for the whole state of Texas. Um, and we've had to put out some crazy fires, which, for me, having been at the distillery almost four years, I can't really think of a time um, that we, we've seen this. And I mean, to a certain degree, I kind of thought we, this was a, there was a lot of it. Um, I mean, I think it was close to a thousand cases, which for us is still, that's, that's, yeah. that's a lot of whiskey. Yeah. And we probably could have produced 4,000 cases. Maybe, I, I don't know. We don't, I mean, obviously hindsight's always 2020. Sure. Um, but I think the response has been great because it's still it's still pretty polarizing, which I think is is always good because if, if it ended up being a very predictable product, I think there's a, there's a level of failure there because it's continuing to create conversation 
it's continuing to sharpen people's palates um, and understanding of what whiskey can be, especially when they're like, wait, this is what, this is what this is distilled. Like, the, oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't realize that these flavors would come out or this is how it would react to, you know, American Oak. Like, wow, this is, I, this does taste a little bit like bourbon and it is reminiscent of some of your other things, but something else magical is going on. And, and I still think at, you know, 50% ABV, it's, it's quite drinkable. So, um, I don't know. I think this is special. This is kind of, I, I think going to rewrite a little bit of what's going on in, um, Texas whiskey history, if you will. So I'm, um, I'm ecstatic about this. So uh, I'm proud to have a couple bottles because I know they're people are trying to run each other over to find them. So it's happening. I, I see what Ben's doing over there. And I was thinking the same thing. It's time gentlemen. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to say, Hey man, tell me a whiskey that sounds like a dessert. I'm going to say the Texas single malt rum cask finish. What do you think about that? Uh, that is what we are cracking open now. Ben's got it there. You can see it. Who decided the order for tonight? Uh, I think that was a team effort headed up by Quan Lee, Jonathan Rogers, maybe, um, yeah, yeah. as well as a panel of people. Yeah, I don't even know if we followed the right order. We've just kind of been diving in. <laughs> well, we, we ended up doing the order that I probably would have suggested. Oh, um, really? A lot, a lot of times you end up doing stuff based on ABV. So you would kind of like start with things that are lighter and go up. Mm -hmm. But even though the Mirador was higher ABV than the Shiner, I mean, they don't read, you know, we did it, we did it in the right order. We, we kind of building and building in boldness and intensity. Um, I think that this, um, and I like that we, uh, you know, we have a couple in the Texas single malt family here because that is what you guys are most known for. I don't know. I guess that's debatable. It depends on the consumer and, and what people talk about when it, for me personally, I get the most excited about the Texas single malt stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to catch up with you guys and pour this so I can see what's happening on the nose. Yeah. And this one, this is definitely, this is the highest, highest ABV. So, you know, if, if, if anybody of course watching is following along and, and took a risk on this bottle, uh, it is higher proof. So I think this is one that continues to develop in the glass and hopefully uh, everyone goes into it, you know, again, sipping a little bit more like tea than trying to chug it because uh, at that, you know, uh, once it surpasses 60%, I think it can be a little bit tougher and hope, you know, ultimately no one, um, no one has to choke it down. Uh, right. Right. Nice. Show sure uh, reference. Thank you. This is uh, this is, this could be, this could be a little abrasive. <laughs> But I still think it's incredibly drinkable. Uh, I, this this whiskey is cool because this I think if you can find older bottlings, I think there's such a stark contrast from previous years. Because I think this 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 one's funkier to me, Jared. I, I don't know. I don't know if y'all blended it a little bit differently, um, but I think this is this is a little bit funkier than previous years. Yeah. Um, what what is the ABV on this, Alex? I don't remember. This is sixty-two. Sixty-two even. Yeah, or at okay. least, yeah, 62. Okay. Um, I don't know why this is true, but in my experience, uh, malt-based whiskeys, single malts, uh, straight malt whiskeys always seem to handle water very comfortably. Uh, sometimes with bourbon, if you, have, if you have like a cast strength bourbon, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But I feel like with malt, you kind of almost can't go wrong. So a lot of the things that we bottle at cast strength at full, like they, they get dumped out of the barrel and don't get any dilution at bottling. Um, part of that is for the nerds and that's who we are. And I, I like the idea that people can figure out for themselves what proof it really works for, for them. Mm -hmm. If you, if you were to take a, just like an X, Y, as you're adding water, the aromatics are improving. Uh, the nose is opening up more thing. It's getting more, it gets more and more expressive. And as you do the same thing, the, the, the body is, is dropping. So you have texture and just how thick it feels. Literally all the things that make flavor that are in there are packed into a tiny package. The more water you add, you're diluting it, right? Spreading that out. So there is kind of this dance and everybody has to figure out for themselves. Um, I love, especially with malts. I mean, just, if, you, if you've got something that you just want to spend 20 minutes smelling it before you've ever even taken a drink, that's, that's a pretty solid home run. Mm -hmm. But I also love texture. I love things that are coating and oily and just kind of sticky um, when it comes to whiskey. So it's always a dance. So a lot of our special releases get released 
at whatever proof they come out at, because we want you to be able to find that sweet spot for yourselves. Um, some people love the heat. Some people love the burn. Like, man, I'm drinking whiskey. I want to know I'm drinking whiskey. And so when things are too diluted, you lose that. Um, so I already added a few drops just after my first drink, just to see what would happen. But you added a few drops of water. Yeah. What I did, did on the, I did on the mirror door too. I was going to say that we moved on, but, um, Is we, we bottled the mirror door a little bit above what we thought it should be at. Mm -hmm. Um, for that very reason, you can enjoy it there. We didn't like it above. So we took some options away from people that we thought were just not right. But we, we, we liked it with a little bit of water. So we, we diluted it about a 1% above what we thought is the, actually the ideal drinking spot for it. Um, when, when, uh, when people, I'm assuming you put two or three drops of just like uh, tap water, uh, people will ask questions about, all right, if I do want to, a lot of the term you'll hear people use is crack it. If I do want to crack it, I do two or three drops of tap water. Is there, if, if you want to go down that path, is there a specific, ABV that you know, okay, if it's this or higher, I want to crack it, or is it just a feel based on? It's just a feeling thing. Yeah, yeah, it's just a feeling thing. If you feel like the nose is a little bit closed up and like it's it's not really evaporating much, it's not very expressive. It seems kind of dull. A little water can go a long way. Mm -hmm. Just to pop that, you know, just um, yeah. I'll forget all of my bullet points because I don't really like rehearse this stuff or do classes. But diluting alcohol is just fa just so fascinating so when you're adding water to alcohol and i read this somewhere probably a decade ago and i don't remember why this happens but i know it's a fact adding water to alcohol is exothermic which means it releases heat when you combine alcohol with water it warms up and if you ever do a serious dilution like say you've got something that's like 70 you know like a stag or something and you add enough water to it to proof it down you'll feel it it'll be warm in the glass so what are you doing when you're heating it up? You're literally exciting the molecules. They're vibrating faster. So when you talk about waking a whiskey up with a drop or two, I mean, that's not, that's not a bad descriptor for what's actually happening. Um, you're agitating all this stuff. Wood sugar tends to float. It's lighter than a lot of the other elements in the whiskey. So it's going to float and kind of make a little bit of a cap, which is why swirling whiskey is not a bad idea. But dilution also breaks that surface tension, which allows some of the more volatile components to pass these wood sugar molecules. So now all of a sudden it smells like so much more expressive. Lastly, uh, there's all these gases that are in solution in water that cannot stay in solution once they get combined with alcohol. When we do dilution from barrel strength, you know, 65, whatever, to 46 for baby blue, for example, and we put all that water, start putting all the water in the tank. I mean, it is like, it looks like it's, it's carbonated. It is just erupting with all of this, all these bubbles of gases that are in solution and water coming out of solution and just erupting. So all of this stuff is getting like mixed up and agitated. Oxygen is being released, which is also one of the things that's happening during maturation is compounds are getting oxidized. So, I mean, the list goes on and on. Like all these really, really, really cool things happen, even with a tiny amount of water, um, you're basically the oxidation step of maturation. You're kind of doing that on the fly, like right in front of yourself when you add water to it. Um, so I, I know a lot of, especially scotch drinkers that a drop of water goes in period. Yeah. The bottle's 40%, the bottle's 68%. Doesn't matter. I'm about to taste this. It's been sleeping in this bottle. I'm going to wake it up, slap the baby's bottom drop or two of water before they even go for it. And there's a pretty strong scientific back, backing for, for that really kind of agitating some stuff up and waking it up for sure. Sorry, that's, I don't know if that was un unwarranted. No, no, well, uh, I don't know, but it's interesting to me. That's the way I was taught to drink scotch was that you crack it every single time. And to the point where like, all right, I'm going to get the timing of these drops down perfectly. I'm not going to let more than three drops go into this mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times it's like the way you first drink something or taught is the way you sort of stay with it. I know the question that most people probably had as you were breaking that down is, okay, did you like high school chemistry class? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, How did I, that I, happen? I had to get old enough to realize like, oh wait, this can have to do, this organic chemistry and physics and stuff can help you make better beer and whiskey. I'm in. <laughs> I'll, I'll pay attention. I'll do my homework. I know people, and I don't know if you guys are this way with sports, 
I know people in brewing and I've known people in other uh, jobs that I've had in the past that are like this, that are just thorough folks. I knew a guy who, uh, when I was doing a lot of home brewing, he would go through um, the beer judging certification uh, panel. Is that what the P's for in BJCP? I can't remember. The BJCP, which they do the beer guidelines for the US. Um, and it tells you the color and the ABV ranges and how hoppy it can be, all that stuff. All of like, this is how they, this, they, def, they help articulate what styles of beer are, how they're defined. Um, and I had a friend that was going through the handbook and just like brewing every style of beer. And I'm like, I don't even like some of those styles. Why would I ever brew something I don't like? But in his mind, it was part of his professional development to just do his diligent work, to put it in the time and like work on at least brewing once all of these, all of these legally recognized and judged styles of beer. Um, and yeah, I'm just not like that uh, at all. Uh, yeah, yeah, chemistry is fine. Chemistry is fine. But yeah, once you tell me it actually connects to something I'm doing and it matters, then yeah, I'm all in. All right. I want to tell a quick story that I know Ben will enjoy quite a bit about you're talking about mastering your craft and what goes into your craft. So uh, all four of us are hip hop fans, right? Mm -hmm. And the, uh, you know, hip hop's changed quite a bit over the years, but the hip hop of the eighties and nineties, there was some keyboard stuff, but it was mostly the layering of samples, right? Sometimes you would have drum machine sounds. Sometimes you'd have sampled drums and you would layer these sounds. But Ben and I went to high school together and lived out in the burbs. And when we were getting out into the hip hop world and doing shows and things, we were suddenly mingling and interacting with people that grew up on the opposite side of town or whatever, and making friends with people with different backgrounds than us. And there was one particular, there was two guys, they were twin brothers, but there was one particular guy named Kenneth. Everybody called him K-Flex. That was his nickname. And he was sort of a uh, producer beat making prodigy. And so one of the things that he would do is when he would hear a hip hop song that he really liked, if he knew all the sources of all the samples of that particular song, he would recreate it. He would go and use all the same sounds and recreate it and build that track just to sort of master his artistry, so to speak. Hmm. Wow. And I always thought that that was just the most amazing, cool thing that he would hear. It wasn't somebody showing him. He would hear the sounds go, I know where all this came from. And so he would put it together because he could. And that's what was, that's what I was reminded of when you were talking about, this isn't my style of beer, but I'm going to brew this because I'm going to master my craft. I'm going to do every single step of this. Yeah, that's crazy. I thought that's it was pretty, pretty cool too. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a smart way to to go about learning, uh, you know, studying another genius, you know, it's, it's private. You're not biting his style, but he goes and learns exactly how they made that beat. It maybe opens something up in his mind next time he started making a beat. Oh yeah. I now hear something or see something I could use differently. That's pretty cool. Absolutely, man. Are you yeah, guys, we talk, go ahead. Yeah, we talk a lot just because, you know, doing single malt in the U S especially when we started, wasn't that common and, and still kind of is known single malt. You say single malt, people are like, Oh, I don't drink scotch. Like, no, this is, you can make it, you're making, it's been made all over the world. It's being made in Japan. It's being made in Taiwan. Right. It's being made in uh, India, New Zealand, um, and uh, central Texas. But um, <laughs> there is, I mean, there is a philosophical thing you have to decide for yourself um, that has a lot to do with Eastern versus Western aesthetics. You know, obviously very American to, to value innovation and, and newness and individuality. Um which is not necessarily, that's just a, that's just a cultural difference. It's not necessarily shared with the rest of the world. Um, you know, I did ceramics in school, uh, thought I was going to be a, a potter or, or go on to teach, you know, college ceramics. And so obviously we had the history of ceramics is super, super just knee deep in Japanese and Korean and Chinese culture and philosophy and aesthetics, um, which kind of clashes. It's the, uh, the, it's, it's kind of been lost on people, but the idea of a masterpiece, we think a masterpiece is just like, oh, wow, you did something really badass. The masterpiece was when you were apprenticing with someone, you were training under a master. Mm -hmm. And the day you could present something that they couldn't tell was not theirs, that you made, that was your masterpiece. You that? made that piece and now you are a master because you can do what I do as well as I do it. Now, go out into the world and you don't have to keep doing what you've been doing while I've been training you. You can do whatever you want because you're obviously that skilled 
to pull it off. And I've been doing this, you know, this, this guy that's 70 years old and his protege can now imitate his work so well that the master can't tell the difference. Are, are so, you, go, no, go ahead, Jared. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm I was going to say, there's this thing about not, you were talking about like not biting someone's style. Um, there is a way of ripping someone off and not giving them credit. That's, that's lame. Right. But, uh, you know, to, that can be, a, I mean, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's the finest form of flattery, you know, imitation. It's, uh, if someone's that awesome, man, yeah, go, uh, what's the guy's name? You guys, uh, I'm blanking for a second. He, uh, part of Slum Village. Um, oh, JD. No, um, Elzai. You listen, you're familiar with Elzai? Uh, yeah. Um, so he did, he did a remake, well, not really a remake, like kind of an inspired by a uh, remake of um a Nas album and it's almost like a verse for verse riff mm -hmm. and you can almost feel the rhyme schemes relating but he didn't really bite it and the beats are different i don't know just that to me stuff like that is like that's a massive respect move that is like telling somebody i'm gonna riff on what you did because i hold you in that that high of an esteem and that's not biting and of course you know being public about what you were trying to do and where your inspiration came from um as opposed to just like no, I'm going to steal this beat and rap over it and throw it on SoundCloud. Like, yeah, that's lame. But dude, um, I'm so glad you brought this up, Jared, because this is a perfect time for me to tell you guys I'm starting a new whiskey line called Ben Coney's. Oh, nice. And yes, and it's uh, mostly as a tribute. I feel it feels uh, so respect. I mean, I <laughs> he has studied over the course of Whiskey Talk 3, and now he's starting his own. <laughs> You Coney. know, uh, one of the things we do, and maybe it's the whiskey talking, but we do go off on tangents because it's fun. And when you were talking about the cultural history, I've got, maybe you guys have seen this. If you have the chance, watch the documentary Ramen Heads. Have, has anybody seen or heard of Ramen Heads? Is ramen it Heads? No. It's about the, it's about ramen noodles and the art of making ramen noodles. I saw it on a plane flying back and it's on that last time I checked, it was on Netflix. They rotate stuff out. Ramen heads will make you appreciate ramen noodles in a way that you didn't even know was possible. It will blow your mind. And they, they have the whole idea of the master and the apprentice. And then maybe one day he can open up his own ramen shop. But it's, wow. if you want to get into the, the, the master craft of something that you probably maybe took for granted because you do it in a microwave, there's some really good ramen places. Don't, don't yeah. get me wrong it'll expand your uh, appreciation of that tenfold. It's super, super. That's cool. funny. I watch a lot of like food documentaries. It's probably one of my favorite things to spend time with. And I just watched one last night. Um, it's called Hiro, Dreams of Sushi. I don't know Ooh. if any of y'all have seen that. Yeah. Oh, no. no. Really, really solid. And the same the same point, you know, he's, he's working in this place. The guy's 85, he's still working. I think his son was in his 50s or even like early 60s. And he won't even let his son take over yet because he's like not ready, right. you know? Ow. And the kid, the kid's been there since he was 19 or something, and right. now he's 60. And he's like, uh, he'll get it someday, you know. We're working on. I think it's like, uh, what were they doing? I think it was like 10 years before you could even like cook an egg there. You just had to like slice fish or something for 10 years. Yeah, you, know. you did like base prep on like if there were vegetables. You, you could so there was like a 30 year. After 10 years, you get to finally cook an egg. At 10 years after that, you get to finally cut fish. I think. So yeah, you've already been there for 20 before you even get to do anything of relevance. You're just like cleaning pots and pans and stuff. You're the like, yeah, if you can't, forever. If you can't do that for 10 years and stick it out, then you don't really need to be here. You're not passionate enough. Like, man. That's intense. It's a, it's a good one. It's a good one. Um, okay. So uh, one of the things that we tend, so here's what we're going to do when we join you guys again in two weeks. Uh, we're, we're still trying to figure out what we want to do on the next one. We're going to call the next bottles to be determined, but we'll let you know well in advance because uh we we trust us when we tell you we want you to have these bottles in your possession when you join us for these whiskey talks when we're you know gr going at the nose and we're sipping on it we want you guys to be doing it with us at the same time uh but we do go off in a lot of different directions uh do you guys have anything that you want to uh delve into in the world of music you know ben you made some suggestions last time you can change or alter we can do some homework assignments for next time anything you guys want to throw in here before we sign off well, I, I feel like documentaries keep coming up, which is which is fine. But I, I was trying to think of another one 
we also might need to decide if we want to veer off from hip hop. It's an, it's, it's an obvious easy connection. So we've kind of stuck with that, but we can definitely get off that. Um, but I was going to ask if uh, any of you guys had seen the Stone's Throw documentary, uh, My Vinyl Weighs a Ton. I've never seen um, it. I've, are you familiar, I've always are you familiar with Peanut Butter Wolf oh, and all those guys? Absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a really rad. I don't think it's free anywhere. Like it was for a brief moment. It was on for a few months. And then, like you said, things cycle off. And I think now it's like three ninety nine to watch it. But man, even even watching guys like Common talking about sitting like in the basement with Mad Lib and uh, Peanut Butter Wolf and all those guys is just in, anybody's a hip hop fan, especially the kind of the underground stuff that was going on in the 90s. Like that's a that was a really, really well done documentary. Um, it's it's interesting that you bring that up. So the other day, uh, I watched Chasing Train, which is the John Coltrane documentary that's on Netflix right now, and Common is in it, and Common is incredible. And uh, Common said something that uh, when he said, "I was like, man, I think I'm the same, uh, or at least close." But he was, you know, here's a big one of the great hip hop MCs of his generation, and he said that he has probably listened to John Coltrane's "A Love Supreme." more than any other record he's ever listened to top to bottom. Uh, and because for a lot of people, that's a religious experiment. It was a religious record. It was an ode to God and all these kinds of things. But yeah. uh, that's a really good non uh, hip hop conversation piece. If you, if you like people that master their crafts, very few people have mastered yeah. anything more than John Coltrane mastered the saxophone. That was a really good doc on that. Well, and without getting, I know we probably need to wrap up. We've been dragging this on, but going back to my point about imitating masters, for some reason, jazz has always kind of had this Eastern meditative, sometimes explicitly even Buddhist for people. It's got this mantric, repetitive vibe about it. And that's one culture that if you could pull off, if you could pull off no one knowing the difference when you lay down a track and somebody's like, man, is that a Coltrane lick? <laughs> that's good enough. You don't have to go reinvent the wheel. Like right. excellence is rare. And if you could pull that off, that's amazing. Anyway, it's a, it's a great, jazz is a great example of a, a more Eastern aesthetic that it's not just about, oh, I'm going to go be creative and do something that's never been done before. To do something that's been done before is hard if you're trying to do something that was done by a freaking master. That's right. difficult. And if you can pull that off, you're going to get written up in every newspaper and like music, you know, blog. People are going to be talking about, holy crap, this is the next BB King. That would be fine. Right, that'd no one. Great. Yeah, they'd be fine with that. Who oh, we found the next Jimi Hendrix? Cool, you know that's fine. Yeah, I think people are going to be talking about uh, Alex Elrod's mic work tonight for years. Yes. I think it was yeah. unbelievable. You get the MVP tonight. Just look at that thing, man! Fantastic work. <laughs> what is that? It's a karaoke mic. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that my my wife Laura, not your my, no my Laura, yeah. Not, not my wife, Laura. No. Yeah, no, mine. Yeah, that uh, she has. Uh, so <laughs> so here, here's the on scene. Yeah. So love it, uh, love I, it. I, I do. I do have a contribution. So you're gonna have to, uh, for for the for the music talk. It's not hip hop. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> follow me here, because this is this is a little bit of a. I'm ready. A little bit of a walk, if you will. Um, so I've actually mostly lately I've been mostly listening to a lot of uh, um, there's a band called Drain uh, in um, California. It's uh, California hardcore. But so speaking of California, uh, specifically SoCal, uh, there's an uh, American artist by the name of Nick Waterhouse. I had to write notes on this because this is really bizarrely convoluted, but he got his start in Southern California a few years ago. I think it was like 2010, 2012 at the distillery studios whiskey nice. okay let's go let's go so cal um but one of one of my one of something's wrong with this um it's not I hear you. okay you can hear me great yeah. yeah so um so cal distillery uh studios he uh he's done a lot of uh, i think uh studio recording uh tracks with a lot of a lot of artists um most recently he uh probably one big thing that kind of started creating uh, a buzz around Texas was he, uh, he collaborated with, uh, Leon Bridges. Okay. The Fort Worth artist on yeah. the song, uh, that was, uh, it's called Kachi, uh, which I think that might be an explicit term of something, but it's a great song. But, um, I thought, uh, something that was really good is he did a remix of Manchester Orchestra's song, the gold, 
which is a really dark, depressing song and put this really cool uh, remixed upbeat, uplifted beat to it. That's like this rhythmic driving beat that, um, that I think is really great. So The Gold by Manchester Orchestra remixed by Nick Waterhouse, Distillery Studio SoCal, Full Circle. Oh! oh! <laughs> I didn't choke on that one. You should have logged out at the same time, drop the mic, and then like, <laughs> that'd be great if he disappeared. And there's just three of us. Got gotcha. yeah. <laughs> oh, just fell over. I mean, that that yeah. was a that, that I, I honestly thought I, again. I had to take notes on that, and I didn't. I I thought I was gonna choke on my words, but I got through it. Very. Thank bit. you. Yeah. You're good. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. So. Yep. All right. Well, uh, as we mosey on down the trail, I would like to uh, put this out. I know a lot of people watch this via the uh, Facebook page for Balcones, maybe the Ben and Skin Facebook page, maybe the Mighty Eagle Facebook page. Uh, I'll slide this into the Ben and Skin Facebook page tomorrow. But at 10 a.m., uh, there's a local band I like very much called Bastards of Soul. We've probably talked about them on Whiskey Talk before. They're kind of a early 70s sounding kind of uh, Memphis soul R&B sounding outfit. But there's a little 10 minute documentary coming out tomorrow called mm. Just a Little Bit. Uh, and it's got a full live performance of that song and some other things. And then if you're a vinyl head out there uh, releasing the 45 single for If These Walls Could Talk with a flip side, a funk instrumental called Barbecue in Paris. But I think it's a really well done doc. It's the kind of thing where I think if I saw it, knew nothing about the band, I'd be like, all right, I need to know a little bit more. This is pretty rad. So if you joined us via the Ben and Skin Facebook page, I'll slide that in there tomorrow. But I'm excited for people to see that. I think it's uh, it's really good. So awesome. That's awesome. Cool. Rock, rock on. Gentlemen, any final thoughts before we bow out? I mean, I feel like I keep thinking of music stuff I want to talk about, but we've got yeah. weeks. We got we got our whole. We'll see you in, we'll in two weeks, about. right? Yeah, we'll see you in two weeks. Why? Why? There's why? a. I want to throw this out there to you guys. This is kind of next level, but there's an artist who's has made a Christmas song oh. called "Let's." It's a special song, and it's called "Let's Go Farting in a Santa Suit." Oh. and you can find it on Spotify, and I find it just to be very powerful. Well, that's powerfully, I think I've heard it before. Is it powerfully aromatic? Yeah. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Okay. Do I need to wait for Christmas? To... Yeah. Do I need to wait for it's Christmas in a... July and then I'll put it on? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's one of those deals that transcends the month of December. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't there? The, I, I think I, I think I remember. Is there not a music video? I'm, I'm trying to find uh, somebody to do it. I, I can't oh. find an animator. Do you guys know an animator? Uh, you guys, he's not a Pixar, but that's about the closest thing I know. Okay, yeah. Shoot me his number. Yeah. yeah. yeah hey, Pixar. Dr. Pixar, it's me, Ben. I got that's, your number. I think yeah, it's Steve. It's 214-333-3333. Yes. Steve, Steve Pixar. Okay, got it. I was going to say, yeah, I can't remember. I always forget his first name. Steve Pixar. That's right. Steve. Guys, enjoyed it very much. Good, hey, man. As always. always. Good to see you guys. Catch you next time. Cheers, guys. Peace. See ya. Ooh.